Hello History 10, how is everyone doing? Um, today we're going to be going over chapter one um, in the various series of lectures that we're going to have this semester. Uh, so sit back, relax, um, enjoy the videos and the slides um, and all of the discussions that we're going to have. Um, and let me start by uh, kind of making uh, a light agenda for us and maybe making a light introduction. So uh, my name is Professor Skriabin. Um, if you can roll your R's, Skriabin. If you cannot roll your R's, Skriabin or Professor Scrib, Professor S for short, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, and I am half Russian, half Armenian. Um, I was born in Uzbekistan and moved here with my family when I was around two, two and a half, uh, once the Soviet Union uh, collapsed and fell apart. So in essence, um, you know, my family is the immigrant story. And so History 10 has a very special place in my heart just because we do speak about different immigrant experiences um, and also native experiences here. And uh, looking at different ethnicities, how folks and communities are going to be built, uh, some similarities and differences between all of them. And uh, from my background, from my kind of worldview uh, perspective that my family was uh, able to give me, uh, it's a very interesting course to teach. And so hopefully it's also going to be interesting for you as well. Uh, some more introductions about me. My uh, my past involves going to community college um, when I was 18 to 20-ish as well. Uh, so I definitely know what it's like to be a CC student. Um, I transferred to UCLA um, to get my bachelor's in history and then my master's in history as well from Cal State LA. So uh, yeah, there, I know perhaps some of you, you know, are thinking, well, some of my professors perhaps cannot relate to what's going on in my life right now. I definitely can. I was there. Um, working, going to school at the same time, uh, all of it. And so hopefully we're going to have a good uh, time in class. Uh, as far as the syllabus goes um, for the course, as soon as Canvas is up, um, and you'll be watching this as soon as Canvas is going to be uploaded, uh, please go to the syllabus on the left-hand side of Canvas and kind of read through it. Um, I will make uh, a, uh, if I have time, I will make a video going through the syllabus and kind of discussing our various weeks of chapters and readings. But also keep in mind that uh, as the weeks go on, if there needs to be any adjustments made on the syllabus, I will do so. And the most updated version will be on Canvas. Uh, I don't foresee making any drastic changes only because like it's only six weeks of our summer session here. Uh, but uh, hopefully everything will go smoothly. Uh, so. Today, we're going to be going over chapter one and um, <clears throat> having a light discussion on ethnicity versus race and their context and history. Uh, for our textbook, we're going to go through the introduction, Worlds Collide, and the chapter one lecture itself. Our textbook here on the right-hand side, as you can see, is um, Ethnic Dimension in American History. Uh, and here's a link towards Amazon in case you need to uh, purchase the book. So this is the only text that we need for the semester. I highly recommend you get a hold of it as soon as possible uh, and start your readings. Um, so definitely I would recommend get, get through your readings. Uh, make sure you are viewing the lectures that I'm uploading here. Uh, and all of that is going to help you with your discussion questions and or uh, quizzes that I might post up through our summer uh, session right now. So um, a little bit of an introduction for some of you that perhaps have not maybe taken a history class in some time. Uh, a little history 101, if you will. So some dates to note are BC, AD, and BCE, and CE. For, uh, for anybody that is from the religious uh, side, uh, perhaps you are a Christian or Catholic, uh, BC denotes before Christ, AD is Latin for Anno Domine, which means in the year of our Lord. Now, traditionally, this is a very Eurocentric way of looking at history and uh, the peoples that lived uh, through these times because it is through the lens of Christianity. And so to kind of uh, fix that or to be a little more inclusive to other cultures and religions of the world, because not everyone in the world believes in Christianity, uh, they converted it to BCE and CE. So in the texts, 
if you are ever looking at BC, AD, or BCE, CE, those are the d common distinctions typically. Uh, typically in more modern historiography, we go forward with BCE and CE because it is a little more, uh, I guess, uh, inclusive, right? Um, a little more politically correct. And so, um, it, even though they're trying to attempt to be a little more inclusive, it's still kind of on the dividing line of uh, the, the birth year of Jesus Christ, the exact same timeline historically, um, but at least the um, acronym is different. Uh, also, as we are moving th uh, through our readings for the centuries, um, it is important to note how to read it. And so a lot of times my students will ask me, and let's say if it says, uh, I don't know, we're having a discussion about the 16th century. They're like, oh, 16 equals 1600s. Uh, that's not the case. So if it's 16th century, you always go down a number. So 16th century would be 1500s. 10th century would be 900s. 20th century would be 1900s and so on and so forth. So just something to keep in mind as we're going through the readings and lectures and discussions. Um, and so kind of a little history 101 for you. So let's do a little bit of an intro recap from the book, from the text. Uh, this class is definitely going to be some type of hybrid and morph between, uh, I guess, ethnic studies and US history. Uh, and so it is a history course. So we're definitely going to have a little bit more on the history side, but we're always going to be looking at different uh, chapters through the lens of uh, you know, uh, ethnicities, diversity, and different experiences that people have had within the United States. Uh, and so hopefully it'll be an interesting uh, dynamic. Uh, and so as we're going through these various groups and communities, uh, it is important to understand that, you know, many of them are going to have uh, ethnic ties and loyalties to toward one another, uh, especially, you know, when we're talking about the uh, 1800s, uh, 1900s, sometimes the 1700s, uh, as people are moving towards a new country and land, they are going to gravitate towards their own, right? You feel more comfortable. You're going to settle down in a community um, of your peers that know your language, your culture, etc. Um, it is important to note that the United States, for the majority of its history, has been mainly Protestant dominant based in culture. Uh, and so for the longest of times, it has been Protestant and white. Uh, and so historically, Native Americans, African Americans, uh, Mexicans, etc., have been on the marginalized side of history. Uh, and so over time, this has led to racism and also ethnocentrism. But speaking of ethnocentrism, what is that? Uh, it is, and some people do that today as well. It's not merely reserved for the past, but ethnocentrism is viewing or um, basing your viewpoints on other cultures and other people based off your own preconceptions of the world. So for instance, if I'm half Russian and Armenian, uh, and that is my worldview, I was born as that, my family cuisine and language, and heritage, and kind of the way we view the world was from a Russian Armenian lens. Uh, that means that implicitly my own bias, whenever I'm speaking to, uh, to anybody, of a different culture or background is going to be from that lens. And so sometimes we have to kind of disassociate our own experiences and thoughts and prejudices, um, you know, when we are viewing different cultures, right? So something to keep in mind. Uh, the melting pot ideology, that's an important one. Uh, many of you, if you are children of immigrants, uh, you will know this as well that around the world there is this you know, consistent narrative that the United States is a melting pot for people, right? Um, and that if you come to the United States, you can achieve the American dream um, and everyone kind of morphs into becoming an American. Uh, now, this theory uh, states that everyone eventually, once they come to the US, will morph and melt into the same type of people. And eventually we will have the same, um, you know, people, language, color, lang uh, you know, uh, race, nationality, etc. Um, this is still going on 
obviously, because we're always getting a fresh influx of immigrants and immigration. Uh, but it's one theory. Um, there's some merits to it, right? Some pros and cons. Uh, you know, there's always some level of natural assimilation that occurs. So if any of your parents were immigrants here, and let's say they are still speaking in an accent, and they still are kind of in the mindset of the old country, wherever that may be, uh, you implicitly growing up here, or whether you've been here for a number of years, and you are an immigrant yourself, you inevitably are going to take on some more American values and some more Americanization into your culture and soul. Uh, and so melting pot theory, uh, there it is, some pros and cons. Uh, cultural pluralism. Um, this is the right of every ethnic group to sustain its own identity. So as we are going to be going through uh, our various chapters, we're going to see that some cultures and groups, um, as they are coming to the United States for various reasons, uh, some are better than others at maintaining their cultural identity. And so that means that they are holding their identity, their language, their culture more close to the heart, and they don't do not want to assimilate into the United States uh, hegemonic culture um, as easily versus others are really kind of quick, right? And so we'll kind of be uh, viewing those um, as time goes on. And so the main thesis of the introduction of the book, I would say, is that immigrants overall are risk takers. This is a land of immigrants. And so it's very important to look at immigration and the various immigrant groups that sustain the United States. Uh, and so we are risk takers. Uh, immigrants seize opportunities for a better life and approach it in a pragmatic way. Pragmatic means a strategic, realistic way. Um, and so they initially, even before they come to the United States, right? Let's say they are back in the home country and they already have the idea of selling everything, right? Um, and you know, taking whatever belongings or money they have and just moving to the US to make life work. At that moment in time, the author already um, believes that they are you know, the embodiment of the ideal American worker, right? The ideal American uh, uh, you know, cultural uh, icon, right? Uh, and so it's very interesting to kind of read through some of this. So if you have time, please read through the introduction. It gives you a nice kind of recap of some of the uh, theories that we are going to be using and recycling throughout the chapters. Uh, if you have time, please watch this salad bowl or melting pot theory. Uh, so this is from Professor uh, <clears throat> uh, Magala. And so he uh, details some of, you know, kind of comparing the two, right? The salad bowl theory and the melting pot theory. Uh, and so um, the difference mainly is that the melting pot, everyone is going to go into a pot, melts and kind of mix and mash and form. And eventually everyone will be American, whatever that means. Salad bowl theory states that let's say if you are eating a delicious salad and uh, you know, you can clearly see the croutons, the tomatoes, the cucumbers, the lettuce, etc. Every group is kind of distinct, but together they make a wonderful salad. And so salad bowl theory states that everyone could live within the United States, but the communities and the different ethnic groups are still going to retain their various identities, right? Uh, so definitely watch this in your spare time if you can. Um, I will not be showing the videos here um, just because, number one, I have no idea how the YouTube algorithm is going to uh, flag or not flag things. Number two, uh, I'd rather just save these for a uh, lecture to, give, to get my point across. And so as you're going through these lecture slides, um, I recommend having the Google Slides, which will be made available to you on the side. And so you could always pause this and then start uh, you know, watching the video through the Google Slides and then kind of come back for lecture. <clears throat> so here's a wonderful uh, representation of the melting pot, right, of America. And so here we have everything represented from Europeans, we have Latinos, we have Jewish, African, uh, and then hilariously enough, right on the very bottom in a kind of joking uh, manner, on the very bottom right, we have a little bottle with uh, skull and bones, right, uh, called Trump. <laughs> so uh, it's very, it's a kind of comedic way of kind of representing the melting pot. But, you know, there it is. Uh, and this is a couple more different representations. So on the left hand side, uh, it's sort of a washer, 
uh, kind of environment, uh, you know, where you're kind of washing clothes and uh, all of these different flags and nationalities and peoples are kind of being kind of like just sucked and gobbled in and then being funneled and the end product is Americans. And so inevitably, um, the theory is that no matter who comes to the U.S., eventually, right, they're going to be spit out as Americans. And so here on the right hand side, we have this wonderful political cartoon of Lady Liberty stirring the pot of citizenship um, and equal rights. And so all of these different types of peoples and individuals are kind of seen and represented in the citizenship cup. Uh, and so supposedly, right, it's supposed to be equal rights. Everyone is equal no matter uh, where you come from, where you, you know, originally uh, hail from. Uh, and as long as you can make the United States your home and adapt to a certain degree, you could be a citizen and everyone would have equal rights. And then the salad bowl theory that we were discussing before, right? All of these various individual pieces uh, that come together to make a wonderful and beautiful salad. However, they are all still distinct and have their own, uh, no pun intended, flavor. Okay, worlds collide. So this chapter, or I get, I guess this inter interim chapter before chapter one starts, uh, it's called Worlds Collide, and so it has a general discussion of uh, different immigrant groups, experiences uh, within North America and Europe, and kind of coming in here uh, as immigrants. And so, you know, in the 15th, 16th century. Uh, we are going to look at multiple examples of European upheaval. Uh, Europe was not having the best of time. There were religious conflicts, there were wars, there were famines. And so those were going to be various catalysts for people moving to the United States. And, uh, you know, at that point in time, they were reading newspapers and magazines saying that the United States is filled with opportunity and land. And so obviously when things are not going great in your home country and you're reading about this wonderful new land called America, you're going to perhaps, hopefully, at least give it a shot. And so we're going to be seeing many Europeans come on over, over the years. Uh, Non-sectarian culture. So these are early colonies that grew um, or one that's not based on any particular religion or political group. And so there were so many different immigrants from different uh, faiths, backgrounds that, you know, eventually, um, <clears throat> you know, they were going to form a some type of uniform system. And so once they started to get funneled into the U.S., this type of non-sectarian culture was going to be formed or this early form of Americanization, right? Whatever that means. So if you come here and you want to be a quote unquote, or quote uh, American, that does not necessarily denote that you will be a specific religion um, or, uh, you know, have any specific cultural uh, sort of rituals or ties or anything. Uh, being an American should allow you the freedom of religion, the freedom of your own space. Uh, and so as we're seeing all these different groups in Europe, the Jews, Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, Lutherans, etc., uh, many of them were coming to the United States for uh, religious security, right? And so from the book on page eight, uh, they very poignantly say that all minorities uh, and to protect its own security, each had to guarantee the security of others. And so what that means is as the all of these various groups were coming to the United States uh, in order to find work and a happy uh, life, they had to ensure that their neighbors were also getting and receiving the benefits of the American dream, of the ability to continue to practice their own culture and heritage and religion. And therefore, their neighbors would also protect their rights, right? Kind of American Freedom of Religion, Bill of Rights 101. And so, even though many of these early colonists and immigrants later on uh, would try to enact these kind of individualistic or individualized uh, rights, to retain their culture, their language, their religion, etc. Uh, over time, we will inevitably see that people of color uh, would be systematically excluded from these various American ideals. So we will be discussing Native Americans, African Americans, Asians, Asian Americans, uh, Mexicans, uh, Latinos, 
Uh, so anybody that was not eventually in that white Protestant dominant culture uh, for many decades and centuries were uh, essentially made into second class citizens. And so we will see how all of this unfolds over the various chapters that we were going to uh, look at and study. Ah, Worlds Collide Part 2. And so like we were saying before, we had freedom of religion, um, which also implies that the United States is going to be a, a diverse uh, country religiously. And something that the early colonies also had to contend with and what the United States over time had to contend with time and time again as all of these immigrant waves are coming hundreds of thousands millions from around the world not just Europe but from around the world would all of the idealistic American privileges extend to people of color as well that was the main question that they also had to answer them to themselves and the main answer was no they did not want to extend those privileges uh, and so the last number of decades that we've seen, especially in the modern day, has been an intense fight between these various immigrant groups and disadvantaged groups. Uh, and so they have been fighting consistently right, for equality under the law and in more of today's context, equality socially and to win over the hearts and minds of individuals, which is the much more difficult thing to do just because. It is much easier to change the laws of a country, but it's much more difficult. Um, I, excuse me. It is not as difficult to change the laws of a country, but it is much more difficult to change the mental state of people. That takes generations, right? And so this term race is going to be used once in a while. And let us kind of talk about race. So race is, by definition, a social construct, an invented reality created by institutional structures of society and employed by those in positions of authority to perpetuate their power on page 10. And so this articulates the term race pretty well. Um, race was developed um, back in a very kind of Darwinian way through social Darwinists. Um, and so it was created by uh, individuals who wanted to essentially subdivide the human population. So instead of considering everyone human, whether you are white, brown, black, yellow, etc., uh, they started to create different races, typically mainly um, from black and white, um, eventually stating that African Americans or just blacks in general uh, were not uh, the same type of humans. They were a subset of human beings. And so this was, you know, kind of a invented reality used to perpetuate the authorities at bay um, at play <clears throat> and eventually this was obviously deconstructed uh, and so in the modern context uh, race is still kind of thrown around here and there but uh, if we were going to look at different groups uh, ethnicities right or different ethnic communities are probably the better term i guess to use uh, and so over time we see that the quote unquote white race or whiteness in general through centuries, right, uh, starts to become the normal social construction. And so because of Europe's, uh, you know, exportation of culture, uh, a very Eurocentric ideal of beauty, strength, status and power ends up becoming sort of the uh, law of the land of the United States. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we are also going to be looking at some of these discussions as time goes on in various different communities. Um, you know, how do how do these conversations come into play um, in a historical uh, narrative, but also sometimes a sociological uh, and cultural right way. <clears throat> uh the author also goes into and during worlds collide uh you know discussing what the united states legislatures and congress is going to do throughout all of our chapters uh systematically because once again the united states was for the longest time a very kind of majority protestant white nation uh for the majority of the time the legislatures and congress attempted to the very best of their abilities to exclude people of color from their liberties 
uh, ends to attain equality in whatever way, shape, or form. Uh, and so we are seeing, you know, or are going to see through the various chapters, this push and pull dynamic, right, as time goes on. Uh, spoke about the Great Migration. We'll get into that as well. Um, where <clears throat> uh, f during the 1800s, pretty much, the 1800s was that, was that golden period of time for the United States where they were growing and thriving. Uh, if you look at any, let's say, historical narrative throughout all of history, whether it's a kingdom, an empire, uh, a nation state, whatever, where whenever it's born, right, it's tiny, and then it kind of starts expanding and expanding, and there's a usually a golden sweet spot, right, for expansion and really kind of incorporating as much strength and power and immigration and money and resources as possible. So for the U.S., the 1800s was that booming generation. Uh, and so we started getting millions upon millions of people from all around the world coming to the U.S. Uh, for, uh, for work, for farmland, a better life. And to also, most importantly, run away from a lot of the problems around the world that they were facing. Uh, we were going to look at one of our chapters, uh, chapter three, I believe. So it's going to be for week two. Uh, westward expansion. Uh, we are going to look at westward expansion, how many of the settlers started to move towards the American West. So if any of you are fans of uh, cowboys, uh, you know, the Western Plains, Vaqueros, uh, Native Americans, trading uh, amongst French and Spanish and English and all of that, uh, we are going to look at Western expansion eventually um, and how in the process Native Americans and Mexicans started to see their lands taken away uh, in favor of the national expansion narrative of the United States. And so the introduction and worlds collide of the text, and I haven't gone through every single thing, but just a general kind of uh, recap there, uh, kind of sets up the book nicely for us, right? The various things we're going to look at um, and how we are going to view and interpret things moving forward. Uh, so without further ado, let us begin chapter one. The very first chapter is poignantly uh, the first Americans, uh, which is the Native Americans. Um, arguably, every single group that has come to North America uh, after them are immigrants. And so the Native Americans are the first original inhabitants of North America. But we will see exactly how that came to be. Uh, and so there are various um, <clears throat> scientific and DNA analyses and test studies that have been done by National Geographic and other uh, sort of anthropological mapping uh, in the various years. And so through all of the scientific data that we have in conjunction with archaeology and digging up of bones and using some of that bone evidence to extract DNA and uh, remap that DNA in terms of today's population groups uh, spread all around the world. Um, we are able to make this current viewpoint and determination. And so the inhabit inhabitants of North America were originally from Siberia, right? So this early form narrative of everyone hails from Africa and then eventually from Africa, everyone starts spreading and uh, migrating out. And so the theory goes that as the various groups that are traveling through, um, you know, what is modern day Russia and Siberia, right? They're traveling, 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 uh, that there was this large gap of ice, the Bering Sea Strait, because during that time it was an enormous ice age. And so that um, in the current, you know, in the current ge geographical space between Russia and Alaska, it's all water. Uh, however, the Bering Sea Strait, I believe I have a map here. So between Russia and Alaska, the Bering Sea Strait, all of this territory here within yellow was frozen over, essentially making a wonderful land bridge for them to walk across. And so essentially the Siberians slash Asians became the original Native Americans, right? In the uh, North American plains. And so, uh, you know, over time, Obviously, the Bering Sea Strait uh, ended up uh, uh, losing a lot of its frozen mass, right, and kind of deteriorating into what we see now, um, the gap between uh, Russia and Alaska. 
Um, and so as a result of that, uh, the Eastern and Western Hemisphere were divided for thousands of years. So Native Americans were able to uh, grow their civilizations and evolve and, you know, kind of prosper uh, without any outside interference. And we even have DNA evidence today of current peoples in Mexico um, of the Mayan ancestry blood, actually. So if anybody goes to Cancun or wants to visit Chichen Itza, the famous pyramids, uh, you know, some of the modern day Mayans actually have DNA evidence that they are related to modern day Mongolians, right, from Asia. So it, it is wonderful to see some of that DNA evidence actually uh, validate some of our uh, theories. On the eve of colonization. So before any Europeans actually make it to uh, North America. And for those thousands of years, Native Americans were left alone to grow and prosper. Uh, right before European interaction, what did life look like? So uh, there were, a, you know, a, an enormous amount of different cultures and peoples. And so we had uh, individuals, you know, numbering in the hundreds with different cultures, right? We had 600 plus distinct cultures that we know of as of now. The number might change later on. We have 200 plus languages that we've mapped out so far. Um, more than a few million living in what is now the United States. And so, you know, I've just put together some of these different territories and regions and some of the peoples involved but it was an extremely diverse region and territory, right, that we can agree on. Uh, and the overall conclusion here is that Native Americans were very, very diverse and complex before Europeans even arrived. And so this completely goes against the narrative uh, that some, right, during the uh, various centuries of the 16th century moving onward, especially the social Darwinists and all of the expansionists and conquerors uh, that were eventually going to say that, oh, well, look at these poor people. Um, they are they do not believe in Jesus Christ. They are not Christians. Look at the huts that they live in um, They do not have big glorious cities and civilizations as we do in Europe So therefore they must be backward and they must be conquered and converted and so We're going to see that narrative play out um, in the in the various chapters uh, and have a discussion about how that came to be but at least before the eve of colonization, it's you know good to note that not every uh, that those theories do not hold too much ground. And what you know, what kind of religions do Native American groups worship? Uh, they definitely were not Christian, right? Because the hemispheres were completely isolated for uh, for the longest of time. Uh, and so they were actually polytheistic, right? They worshipped and believed many gods. Uh, however, it's interesting to note that although they worshipped a pantheon of gods, right, um, whether it's in the, the rivers, the trees, the mountains, the wind, etc., uh, they still believed in what was called the Great Spirit, this great omnipotent uh, spiritual force throughout the universe. Uh, and so we see this Great Spirit um, embodied in various uh, early form uh I hesitate to use the word mythology, but creation stories is probably the better term. So the creation stories of how the world came to be um, differed a little bit depending on the very uh, on the different uh, tribe affiliation groups. So the Navajo, for instance, believe that human beings emerged from four subterranean underworlds. The Iroquois believe that the life on Earth began when the wife and daughter of the Great Spirit. Uh, fell out of the sky and were rescued by a water bird that placed them on a giant turtle, which was Earth. Uh, and so these stories kind of differ from time and place and geographical location, but essentially all of them have some type of creation story of how their people came to be and how the great spirit right, brought down all of this life for them. And so although Native Americans did not live in permanent settlements, right, as the Europeans would start to... Uh, you know, practice on mass, uh, they definitely were a little more flexible, right? So they would travel with the seasons, the climates, and move wherever the uh, 
the game was right wherever the um, um, wherever the harvests were, were going to be wherever the animals were migrating to and so in many instances after European contact and after many Europeans came for conquering and to reap the benefits of uh, you know gaining and exploiting resources for the riches of their own nations uh, and also for converting the local populace so that they will now believe in God uh, many Native Americans that opposed this situation were either subjugated, exterminated, or converted. And we're going to look at these various uh, instances. Uh, another example, the Grand Canyon's Havasupai is believed that their Blue Lake is a sacred example, right, of some of these early creation stories. And I love to put the Grand Canyon's Havasupai uh, in here as a conversation because... Um, you know, it is an absolutely stunning location, and I visited there myself uh, a couple of years ago for a hike, and we'll kind of detail that in a second. But if you can, please watch this video. This is a wonderful video by the Havasupai tribe themselves, uh, and in it, the tour guide gives his, uh, you know, account of their creation story, and you get to see some of the Havasupai uh, tribe, um, uh, you know, village and how they're living and you know some of their famous blue lake uh waters and waterfalls uh if you are on instagram uh, this location has definitely blown up in the last couple of years uh, for folks moving you know uh our folks coming here for you know let's say a weekend camp stay uh and it is absolutely beautiful pristine untouched land so if you have a few minutes of time please watch this and pause this lecture um it is definitely worth uh your few minutes but uh, as my shameless uh, Instagram plug, uh, I went here with some of my friends a couple of years ago, and it was a pretty intense hike. So essentially, you park on the outside of the Grand Canyon, and you have to hike inland. And so it was a 10-mile hike. It took us eight-plus hours, which doesn't sound too bad. Um, however, we were camping. So all, we, each one of us had our huge, uh, you know, one of those large camping uh, backpacks. And it was around 40 pounds. So on a good day, right? Eight plus hours, 10 mile hike with just, you know, a bottle of water. You know, it's doable with 40 pounds on you. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were breathing heavy at the end, just to say the least. Uh, and so as we were there uh, at the village, and we were absolutely, as you might imagine, just dying. Uh, we, my friend told the group that, oh, well, their helicopter service is not working this weekend because of X, Y, and Z reasons. But me being a little more, uh, I guess, adventurous, I'm like, you know, what am I going to lose? Let me just ask the office if they're working this weekend. So I asked the office, are your helicopters working this weekend? And they said, oh, yeah, of course, you can definitely get a helicopter out of here. And so all of us kind of looked at each other, right, with our uh, sunken faces, and we were just exhausted. And so we're like, how much is it for a helicopter ticket? And I'm thinking $200, $300, something crazy. And he's like, 50 bucks. And I'm like, boom, sold. And so it took us five minutes to helicopter back. And so what I ended up realizing once we got to the actual village for camping and to look at all these beautiful waterfalls was that all of the Instagram influencers were just hellying uh, into the campsite and then they helicoptered back and they didn't have to actually go through that hike. But... If any of you want to drive to Arizona towards the Grand Canyon and make the actual trek, uh, it is definitely a life, uh, you know, changing experience and once in a lifetime bucket experience to hike into the Grand Canyon with all of your gear. Highly recommend you do so um, if you uh, have the time and the will. Um, the Navajo territories are absolutely stunning as well next to the Grand Canyon. Another location that I went to with some of my friends. Uh, th and the entire place literally looks like a you know a computer wallpaper right uh, the walls were sculpted uh, from sand and wind over uh, millennia and these you know beautiful canyons are preserved here and they are part of the Navajo territory uh, and so you can go in and get a tour right if you are traveling through there so I highly also recommend um, to make this uh, make this trek and journey and uh, the photograph on the right hand side was this really cool uh, Navajo teenager that I met there. He was working uh, and helping his uh, dad and his uncle. 
Uh, and he was a, just a whiz on Instagram with all the various filters. So he's like, oh, you know, let me let me take a uh, let me take a photo of you. And then he just was like playing with all the settings. And then boom, he gave me um, this wonderful shot on the right hand side. But uh, definitely, definitely a place to visit um, within uh, the southwest of the United States. And here's a short video of it's called Antelope Valley this entire location. So if you have some time, please watch this it's only a few minutes, a few minutes long. Um, and you know, just for you to get the kind of, you know, atmosphere, right, of Antelope Valley and kind of walking through these various locations. Um, as you can imagine, um, or probably know already, um, I do like to travel and I love to um, camp and go on hikes. And so kind of definitely marking a lot of these off my bucket list. Mesa Verde is another one. Uh, if you want to drive to Mesa Verde National Park and visit the Pueblo uh, settlements there um, that are buried into, or not buried, they are built into the rock face, right, of the cliffs. Um, it is, you know, one of the oldest uh, kind of structured settlements that we have in the United States as far as Native American settlements go and, and uh, pretty well preserved. Um, if you have the time, Please uh, watch the video on the right hand side. Uh, it details some of these from National Geographic. So it details some of the history of the site and location. Uh, it was actually the first site to have protection status in the U.S. Um, even before the National Park Services, uh, you know, be, uh, came into fruition under Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and so, uh, definitely um, one for the books as well. So if you go through, um, you know, it is just an intense uh, experience, right? Kind of trying to see how these folks were living um, in these various uh, types of conditions, right? And hiking throughout all of these different staircases and everything. It's, it's a completely different kind of uh, world-changing mindset. Uh, over time, uh, we are going to see that uh, you know, Native Americans, as we're pushing forward into the 1700s and especially the 1800s, the 1800s are perhaps uh, going to be uh, the worst of the situation as far as Native American white interactions because of westward expansion. But even as far back as the 1600s, once early, early colonial kind of settlements began in North America, uh, we start to see that warfare was waged. Um, and peace was not going to last. We're going to, you know, look at various individuals that were establishing these towns, such as Jamestown and others. Uh, and at time, we're going to, um, you know, turn on the native populace in a very heavy-handed military fashion and way. Uh, and so this would not be uncommon moving forward. Uh, and so many of the immigrants and the British and later on the Americans were going to use a very heavy handed uh, methodology in order to deal with the native populace because at the end of the day they wanted their land, they wanted uh, to push them further west as much as possible. And uh, in doing so, the various European powers are going to uh, come into conflict with one another. Uh, and the Native Americans started to use it to their advantage whenever possible. So, for instance, out of all of the European powers that came to North America, the French were the most kind to uh, the Native American groups uh, because they wanted to peacefully trade with them. The French were all about, uh, you know, trade. Uh, the English, on the other hand, were far more involved in actually creating agricultural uh, farms and building per permanent settlements in forms of cities and so in order to do that you need control of the land and so whereas the french would just come in build maybe a trading post here and there and do some light trading with furs and such um the brits and later on the americans the inheritors of this anglo-european uh cultural mindset are going to start to push everyone west more and more um and i don't have it here but uh, we will also be going through uh, discussions of the third big, large European power at play in North America, which is the Spanish. Uh, and the Spanish mantra was conversion. They were all about religion and Catholicism. Uh, if, any, if any one of you in class um, is Catholic and your family hails from anywhere in Central or South America, 
um, you know that Catholicism and religion is still very important in various communities. Um, and all of this starts from right these interactions. So it's very interesting to see. Um, and as time goes on, as the decades progress and as the centuries progress, the one main uh, vein of struggle for this group is going to be disease. Warfare did not kill nearly as many natives as uh, diseases did. So biological warfare is definitely a big one. And because uh, West and Eastern hemispheres of the world were separated by millennia, uh, they had absolutely no immune system when it came to European diseases such as smallpox, influenza, uh, whooping cough, etc. And so in many cases and occasions, by the time the Europeans uh, or the Americans later on came upon these various settlements and peoples, half or 60% of their population sometimes would be decimated already by disease. So, you know, I'm not a, obviously a brilliant military strategist or general in the military, but uh, how can somebody put forth a very good military defense against, you know, all of these newcomers when half or more of your population has been decimated by disease alone? Uh, and so all of these different factors and scenarios are going to start stacking up against Native Americans over time. Uh, and so we will going to obviously discuss them right as the lectures kind of go on even more. But that's the end of chapter one, for the most part. Chapter one is a very kind of early introduction onto uh, the movements and migrations from Asia, um, how some of the Native Americans came to be, what kind of religion they worshipped, uh, some little snapshots of wonderful uh, spots and locations nearby towards uh, from uh, our location where you can go and visit. Uh, and so definitely, uh, definitely, you know, keep on taking some of your notes. The Google Slides are going to continue to be available to you, uh, as are my lectures here, uh, where I try to consolidate as much information as possible. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time to view the lecture. And hopefully I was able to consolidate some of the information. Uh, and all of this can hopefully help you for your discussion questions moving forward. See you on the next lecture.